Two million nine hundred thousand. Three million. Three million one hundred thousand. Three million two hundred thousand. That's three million two hundred thousand. The bidding is for one fifth of an ounce of carbon under an inch square. The Agra diamond. It will bring almost seven million dollars. At three million seven hundred thousand pounds. For the last time. Whether rich men's gaudy trifles or rare and noble productions of nature, the aura and mystique of precious gems have captivated mankind since the beginning of recorded time. To wrest them from the earth, men have labored and suffered and died. To possess them, men and women have sold birthright and virtue. Committed unspeakable crimes and noble deeds. By definition, beautiful, durable, and rare. Their fascination to the human psyche seems fixed for eternity. Let us now journey around the world to unlock it. Of all the marvels in the National Museum of Natural History, one has captured the public imagination above all others. Cloaked in mystery and romance, it is said to be cursed, bringing misfortune to those who possess it. Perhaps it is legend as much as beauty that attracts so many visitors, eager to glimpse the Hope Diamond's regal elegance, even through thick, bulletproof glass. In India, so the story goes, the Hindu goddess Sita invoked the curse when the diamond was stolen from her statue. After a century in the crown jewels of France, it disappeared and later surfaced in the collection of London banker Henry Philip Hope, hence the name. Several owners later, jeweler Pierre Cartier embellished the legend of the curse to titillate a customer, eccentric American heiress Evelyn Walsh McLean. She treated the world's biggest dark blue diamond casually, wore it to the movies and while shopping, and even let her dog romp outdoors with it fastened around his neck. Jeweler Harry Winston bought it from her estate in 1949 and later donated it to the Smithsonian Institution. The Hope Diamond and most other minerals classified as gemstones, about 90 in all, were created in the fiery cauldron of the Earth's interior millions of years ago, at temperatures so high that rock boils. In time, as they cool, they formed into crystals. Men would come to treasure them and endow them with supernatural powers. Symbol of virtue and purity, courage and virility, diamond would protect against evil. Ruby was believed to cure inflammation and hemorrhage and remedy flatulence. Emerald could alleviate both dysentery and constipation and predict the future. Yellow sapphire relieved jaundice and was an antidote for poison. For most of history, gems belonged exclusively to royalty and nobles. The Agra diamond was given in tribute over 400 years ago to the first Mughal emperor of India for sparing the lives of an enemy's family. Rulers flaunted their jewels as evidence of wealth and symbols of power. Rubies, pearls, emeralds, and sapphires set in gold crowned the heads of early Russian czars. More than 3,000 diamonds sparkle in the crown of state of Iran. Confiscated in the Islamic revolution that overthrew Shah Reza Pahlavi, the crown jewels provide backing for Iran's currency to this day.
1946, Ismaili Muslims staged a colorful spectacle in East Africa to honor their leader, the Aga Khan. Ten years earlier, the tribute had been his weight in gold. Today, the gift will be diamonds. One by one, transparent bulletproof boxes packed with stones are placed on the scale until they match the Aga Khan's 243 pounds. Later, he donated the value of the diamonds to his many charities. Ancient traditions surround the jewels of Britain's imperial state crown, worn by the monarch on special occasions, such as the opening of Parliament. Weighing nearly three pounds, the crown features the Black Prince's Ruby, a gift to British royalty over 600 years ago. Not until the end of the 19th century was it discovered to be not a ruby at all, but a poor relation, Spinel. As technological change led to diffused wealth, a burgeoning middle class could aspire to the romance and glamour associated with the adornments of the very rich. No longer were precious jewels exclusive to the high and mighty. Now a tourist attraction on New York's Fifth Avenue, the world's most famous jewelry store was founded in 1837 by Charles Louis Tiffany. He bought European gems, notably the jewels of Napoleon III's Empress Eugenie, and with much fanfare sold them to the moguls of American industry. The New York press named him King of Diamonds. Over the years, the company has made such diverse items as dinnerware for the White House and pro football's Vince Lombardi trophy. A large part of the company's business today stems from an innovation of the late 1800s, a Tiffany design that promoted the American custom of the diamond engagement ring. The stones of most earlier diamond rings were surrounded with metal. The six-prong Tiffany setting holds the diamond up from the band and allows the most light to shine through. The design became the standard. Today, diamond rings are given to three out of four American brides-to-be. A few gems are born of living things, and the most precious come from the sea. Although pearls may be found in temperate waters around the world, they are most closely associated with Japan. Generations hail the fabled Ama, diving girls who could hold their breath for up to three minutes. Oysters were harvested in hopes of finding natural pearls. After Kokichi Mikimoto received a patent on a method for culturing pearls, oyster hunting would give way to oyster farming. Mikimoto's process implants a bead of mussel shell and a tiny strip of tissue into the body of a living oyster. When properly placed, the tissue forms a sac around the bead and covers it with layers of nacre, mother of pearl, to form a cultured gem. Once back in the water, it takes about 18 months, if conditions are good, for the implanted nucleus to become coated to an acceptable thickness of half a millimeter. Sudden drops in temperature and dangerous typhoons regularly threaten the oyster farms. As Japan struggled to recover from the Second World War, its reviving pearl industry was a treasure to be protected at all costs. The effort paid off. Cultured pearls now dominate the world market, and natural pearls have virtually disappeared. Japan sells half a billion dollars worth of cultured pearls a year. Its biggest customer? the United States. Surprisingly, it is the U.S. that supplies the raw material to fertilize Japan's cultured pearl industry. 
In rivers and lakes of the Mississippi watershed grow large mussels that supply the bits of shell used to nucleate the Japanese oysters. Thousands of freelance divers work the area. They crawl along the bottom, often in pitch dark. Many are untrained, and some dives end in death. By far the largest customer for the mussels is the Tennessee Shell Company, run by its feisty president, John LaTondres. You're going to have to check with Peggy about that mark, because I believe we changed that to AW1. Starting in 1954, he built the business from scratch and still supervises every detail. Latondras, who lied about his age to join the Marines when he was 15, says his fascination with pearls began in childhood. My father was quite an outdoorsman, and he enjoyed fishing and hunting. And he found a round pink pearl in South Dakota in one of the rivers. And uh, this pearl eventually became my mother's engagement ring. And after I became old enough to go fishing with my father and my grandfather, I was always looking for pearls. After steaming removes the meat, the mussel shells, 200 pounds to the sack, are shipped to Japan, over 6 million pounds a year. There, the thick calcium carbonate shells are made into spheres that will become the nuclei of cultured pearls. So, on top? So, guys, shut the now. Because of the time difference, Latondras often must work late at night to conduct business with customers in Japan. In 1963, Latondras decided to go into direct competition with his largest customers. He would grow cultured pearls in the fresh waters of southern U.S. lakes. With his Japanese wife, Chessie, he developed new ways to embed bits of shell and tissue in the body of a living mussel. By cutting mussel shell into various shapes to use as nuclei, he has created a line of exotic freshwater pearls. The implanted mollusks are returned to the water, and for three years they will cover the implants with secretions of nacre. Slivers of shell will become oddly shaped pearls. Latondras still likes to keep his hand in at harvest time. When I open a mollusk myself, or even when I'm watching some of my staff open mollusks during harvest, it just amazes me and gives me a feeling inside that it's difficult to describe. The elation of seeing something so beautiful coming out of such an ugly animal, to me, it's just uh, like a miracle of God. Some people say, John, you're, a, you're really a pearl designer. You're coming out with pearls and new shapes, new designs entirely. Something new for the marketplace. Well, I, I guess in a sense this is true. Research and development will never end in this business. Competing with his customers has its drawbacks. Latondras likes to tell of one memorable meeting in Japan when he was lectured by a top executive of the Japanese pearl industry. The discussion got around to the point, please tell me why you want to be in the cultured pearl business. You have no, you have no right to be in this business. It is part of Japan's heritage. It's part of our history. Mikimoto is a national figure. And I had lived a moment, just very quickly, and I, I said, well, Henry Ford is part of our heritage. Henry Ford is part of our history. However, look how many Toyotas, Datsuns, Daihatsus we have in America today. And after all, these came from Henry Ford. John Latondras now grosses about $16 million a year, most of it from the sale of shells. Looking ahead, he's acquiring more space, increasing his production, and dreaming, perhaps, of becoming known as the man who did for America what Mikimoto did for Japan.
What legends cloak these splendid stones? Emerald, cherished by Cleopatra and ancient Hebrew priests of the Old Testament, the stone from which the Holy Grail was carved. Today, the second most valuable of all the precious gems. The Andes Mountains of Colombia hold the world's most important deposits of emerald, especially the area around Muzo, where the biggest and best emeralds have been found for perhaps a thousand years. Toward the end of the 20th century, violation of the earth accompanies traditional violence of man against man. When explosives and machines have done their work, men must scrape away the black shale in search of calcite veins that may contain a few crystals of emerald, beryllium aluminum silicate, with a touch of chromium for color. Colombia mines about half a billion dollars worth each year. About 60% leaves the country illegally. In the last 50 years, tailings from the Muzo mines pushed down the mountainside have raised the floor of the valley below by 100 feet. At river's edge, a peasant economy has taken root. Huaqueros, treasure hunters. Perhaps as many as 15,000 entire families dig in the mud day after day always in hope of finding the one big emerald that could make them financially secure for the rest of their lives. More likely to profit are the Esmeralderos, dealers who come from Bogota, the capital. The towels they wear to clean the stones are a badge of their position. They drive hard bargains, but pay cash on the spot. Before reaching the ultimate consumer, a stone will change hands many times, and at each step, the price goes up. The goal of every trader, a markup of 100%. Ruby, the most precious of all splendid stones. Lord of Gems in the Bible, King of Gemstones to the Hindus, to Emerson, like drops of frozen wine. Thailand supplies most of the world's rubies and is a thriving center of trade for sapphires and other colored stones as well. With the government encouraging free trade, business is booming. Over a billion dollars a year makes the gem and jewelry trade a major source of foreign currency. The US and Japan are the biggest customers. Together, they buy about half the total output. A vibrant entrepreneurial spirit and an abundance of skilled low-cost labor power Thailand's gem industry. The majority of cutters handling run-of-the-mill smaller stones are paid by the piece, on average about $4 a day for 20 stones. More experienced craftsmen who work on larger gemstones receive more. Aluminum oxide with a dash of chromium for color, ruby is classified as a corundum, second hardest of all minerals. Sapphire is also a corundum. Its color comes from iron and titanium. 
Thailand cuts and polishes nearly 15 million carats of sapphire a year, about $200 million worth. Sorting and matching such tiny gems require the perfect eyesight of youth. Mostly female, sorters last only a few years before moving on to other jobs in the business. This lot, back in no, no, okay. serious now. This lot, it's all green. Yeah, but cheap quality, you can make a lot of profit, you know. Because in gemstones there are no precise standards of quality and price, most transactions all over the world are conducted in the time-honored custom of the marketplace. Many traders treat it as a game. This you give me one price and this gives separate price. It's good offer, okay. believe me. Pass, pass. You look, it's all greenish. Yeah, yeah. Pass, pass. Why pass? I add other customers here, 325, give you $3 and then you still complaining. Please. Pass. I tell you one thing. Yes. Don't say no, okay? You don't say no. No, no. I'm serious. I say no first and no, because 225 is my last price. Turn. Believe me, if you no. say no, I get very upset. You upset, I also upset. You think you're really upset? You look one more time. I then don't need to look. I already saw school green. green. Believe me, if you say okay. anything, I'll be very upset. 250, that's it. Oh, 250. I don't believe you. You believe me, it's better. 250, that. No, no, 250 cannot. You make profit. Don't tell me you don't make profit. If you cannot pay me 275, you better buy from me. Good friend. <laughs> no? I don't believe you. Oh. Don't Situated south of Bangkok, near the Cambodian border, two provinces, Jantaburi and Drad, mine almost 90% of Thailand's rubies. On average, 100 tons of earth must be moved to recover 50 carats of ruby. With 142 carats to an ounce, that's a ratio of over 9 million to 1. Rubies from Burma are generally acknowledged to be the world's finest, but since the 1960s, when Burmese politics virtually decimated the country's gem business, demand for Thai rubies has increased. Because so much topsoil is stripped away to meet that demand, the government has decreed that worked out mines be planted to grow food, mainly fruit. Even in highly mechanized mining operations, the final step must be done by hand. After sharp-eyed women have culled the gravel from the mine, the tailings will be sold, for two and a half dollars a bag, to be winnowed once again for garnet and smaller rubies overlooked in the first culling. In southeastern Thailand, it seems that everyone is somehow involved with ruby, as a business or a universal pastime. To supplement their farm income when they're not planting or harvesting rice, peasants engage in modest independent mining. Each may take home between four and eight dollars a day. Following old tradition, they wade along rivers and ponds, running buckets full of gravel through rattan sieves. It's quiet work. Holding rubies in the mouth for safekeeping discourages casual conversation. Every day, between two and three thousand traders gather in open market at the town of Borai. In just a few hours, some four hundred thousand dollars will change hands. Most of the rough ruby and sapphire traded here was mined locally, but some has been smuggled into the country from Cambodia, its border just six miles away. In buying stones, one geologist wrote, it is well to remember you are entering the arena to pitch your knowledge against the other man's. 
He regards it as a sporting contest. Your eye must be in training. And if you have not looked at a stone for six months, get someone else to do your buying for you, or you will be badly hit. Recent reports indicate that the Thai ruby deposits may be playing out. If true, it could mean even higher prices for this most expensive of gems, and perhaps a big boost in the market for synthetic stones. Unlike natural stones formed in the earth perhaps a million years ago, this ruby, chemically, physically, structurally identical, was created in a laboratory in Southern California. Although she is not the first to grow ruby, chemist Judith Osmer has pioneered in materials and technique. The flux material that we use is a closely held secret. The fact that we grow it in a high temperature furnace in a platinum crucible and pour the material off at approximately 1,000 degrees C is not secret. The fact that we do not use a seed is what we are most proud of. We want the rubies to grow exactly the way they do in the earth, which means without a seed. For commercial reasons, Osmer protects many details of her production method. The length of time it takes for these rubies to grow can vary from a few days to a few years, obviously. But we grow them over many weeks, and we prefer not to tell the exact length of time, but we will say that it's many, many weeks. We never know what we're actually going to get. We don't have that much control. Every time I open up the crucible and look inside, I'm surprised because sometimes I'll have three or four very nice crystals, sometimes I'll have a huge uh, cluster, and no matter what it is, it's always beautiful. As far as I know, we are the only ones in the world who produce ruby by this technique, either scientifically or commercially. Osmer's company, J.O. Crystal, sends its rough rubies to Thailand to be cut and polished. Osmer handles production. Her partner, Virginia Carter, does the marketing. To distinguish her Ramora rubies from natural, Osmer adds a secret ingredient, a dopant, to her formula. Under ultraviolet light, the dopant gives the cultured ruby a yellow-orange glow. About twice a year, ever since Judith and I started this company, we've had a call from someone somewhere in the world asking Judith to leave that dopant out. And if she will just do that, whoever it is it's calling will buy our entire production sight unseen in one, with one grand large check. Uh, we've never taken them up on that because we sell our entire production every year anyway, so it hasn't been a great temptation. Generally, cultured gems like this 16-carat Ramora sell for about 1 20th the price of natural stones. Similar price structures apply to emeralds, first synthesized in 1935 by Carol Chatham. Today, his company is the world's largest manufacturer of laboratory-grown gemstones. Diamonds were first synthesized in 1955 by General Electric. Today, they're produced by the millions, all for industrial use. GE and others have synthesized gem-quality stones, but at higher cost than natural. Although it can shatter and burn, diamond is the hardest substance known. Able to withstand enormous heat and pressure, it is widely used in cutting and grinding tools. Whether the job calls for brute force or microscopic precision, diamond cuts everything. And only a diamond can cut diamond. But it is for beauty, not utility, that diamonds are cherished. They've been called rare and noble productions of nature and fragments of eternity. Mm -hmm. 
Although generally thought of as colorless, diamond, pure carbon, is found naturally in many colors. Less than one part per million of boron makes it blue. Nitrogen imparts various shades of yellow. Easy to carry and conceal, gems are a most compact form of wealth. One ounce of top quality diamond, a mere handful, is worth as much as 400 pounds of pure gold. Around the world, the word diamond is almost synonymous with the name De Beers, the international cartel that controls the lion's share of the diamond market. De Beers spends about $150 million a year, 50 million of it in the US, on romantic and exquisite advertising, carrying the seductive message that for all of life's celebrations, in all of love's languages, Only a diamond says forever. British Empire builder Cecil Rhodes founded De Beers in 1888, soon after the first big diamond find at Kimberley, South Africa. Tens of thousands of treasure seekers had flocked to the area to stake out claims. Buying out one mine after another, Rhodes soon realized that controlling production was not enough. He also had to take command of distribution to bring supply and demand into balance under his company's control. As decades passed, diamonds were found in other parts of Southern and Central Africa and became a major source of income for several poor countries. In time, manual labor would give way to heavy machinery that could move vast amounts of earth. Conditions vary from country to country, from mine to mine, but on average about 250 tons of ore are mined and processed to yield a one carat polished stone, a ratio of one billion to one. The diamond bearing rock named Kimberlite, or the South African town where it was first found, is crushed and washed. New technology allows separation of diamonds by X-ray, but some plants still use the time-honored grease belt, washing gravel down a belt coated with animal fat. Diamonds, surprisingly, stick to the grease. Cecil Rhodes' dream of diamond dominance was fulfilled, 40 years later, by another British subject. Ernest Oppenheimer, whose company was financed partly by the American banking house of J.P. Morgan, managed to gain control of De Beers and made it grow. A generation later, control passed to Oppenheimer's son, Harry, who expanded De Beers and its associated Anglo-American corporation into an empire of worldwide power. Harry's son, Nicholas, is deputy chairman of De Beers and head of its marketing arm, the Central Selling Organization. CSO. He explains the company's role in benign terms. I think the, the key difference to anything else, any other commodity that I know about, is that we deal in something that is a complete luxury. It's not a necessity. And if people stopped buying diamonds tomorrow, their lifestyle really wouldn't be changed in any way. And this constrains us against either trying to charge too high a price for the goods or trying in any way to behave in an underhand manner. And so we're a monopoly, but we like to think ourselves more as a sort of cooperative, and I think that's the word that 
I think most probably best describes what we do, a cooperative uh, keeping the balance in place between the number of diamonds produced and, and the people who wish to and desire to, consume, to, to buy them. Of all the rough diamonds mined anywhere in the world, 80% pass through De Beers' London headquarters. Fortress-like buildings identified only by the street address. Our cameras were allowed inside on condition that we not film any of the security procedures and equipment. Eight floors at Charterhouse Street are given to sorting and grading the stones into 5,000 separate classifications by quality, color, shape, and size. About 80 million carats are processed each year. CSO, De Beers' marketing arm, is made up of several companies that buy and sell rough stones, advertise and promote polished gems and diamond jewelry. It was originally called the Syndicate, and many in the trade still refer to it by that name. All sales, just over $4 billion a year, go through complex and restrictive procedures called sites, unique in world commerce. Sales are made only 10 times a year, and only to selected customers, like William Goldberg of New York. He is one of about 160 manufacturers and traders, an elite group called site holders, who are privileged to buy from the beers. Every five weeks, the site holders inform CSO of their needs, but can never be certain they will be fulfilled. Usually, buyers get a bit less than they ask for. CSO does not deal directly with its clients, however. Serving as go-betweens, five independent brokerage firms represent the site holders. Benjamin Bonus is Goldberg's broker. He collects the allotted goods and in private consultation with his client, evaluates the stones and the price. Under CSO rules, there is no bargaining over price, amount, or quality. The atmosphere is genteel, the surroundings elegant, but the message is unmistakable. All or nothing, take it or leave it. Only on big diamonds, 10.8 carats and larger, is negotiation allowed. These are Goldberg's specialty. Senior sales executive Jim Pounds comes in for CSO. So. Sir Bill. Jim, what can you do? Can you give him his price? I can't give him 260. Oh, come on. That's, I'm afraid. Oh, what can you do? Let's make it 285, Bill. Uh, I, re I really, I really didn't want to. I really didn't want to start at a low level. I didn't want to start at 250. But I really meant 260. I figured maybe another $5,000, Jim. But uh, I would appreciate if you could help us. It would, it would be significant in, at this particular moment in view of the fact that the margin on the other goods is really very modest, particularly on the, on the extra high colors. Yes, yes. I think we, we do appreciate that. It's, uh, it's rather a shame. I, th I think that the problem lies with the long one. I think this is where maybe our, our calculation... The answer is this. The answer is this. The goods are worth what you ask me. Mm -hmm. The goods are worth 285. Yeah. But but that's not the issue. The issue is I look at it as, as one ball one game. Package. Yeah. And, and therefore I need the support of the fine goods to help on the overall package. Yes. So I'm not arguing on, the, on this one or two stones. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at the broad picture. And you know I'm going to buy the goods because I always uh, need these specials and it's part of our stock and trade. Yes. And uh, I just ask at this particular moment if you would make an extra effort on our behalf. Yeah. 
No, we appreciate we appreciate the problems, and uh, as usual, we'd like to do the business in total. Okay, but, so can I make a compromise? What's that? But but let's not quibble anymore. Down the middle, two seventy five. Two seventy five. Say yes. Yes. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Good boy. <laughs> Thank you very Goldberg's much. goods will be shipped after his check for the full amount has cleared the bank. How they will be sent is a closely guarded secret. No carrier admits to shipping diamonds. De Beers says anonymity is the best security. Almost all the diamonds go to four major cutting centers. Antwerp in Belgium still calls itself the World Diamond Center, but today faces stiff competition. In Tel Aviv and neighboring Ramat Gan, extensive use of computerized, automated cutting machines has helped make Israel the world's leading producer of medium-sized polished diamonds. India, with the lowest labor cost, has the most workers, nearly a million, mainly in Bombay and Surat. Workers who can cut the standard 58 facets into even the smallest stones, considered uncuttable anyplace else. The United States is the biggest market for diamonds, as well as a major manufacturing and trading center. Much of the business is crammed into one block in Manhattan, 47th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. With retailers at street level, cutting factories, brokers, and traders above, the street pulses with activity. Deals are made everywhere. William Goldberg has left 47th Street. His new quarters are in a high security building a block away. Here, his diamond cutters transform the rough stones he buys into polished gems. In this delicate and often lengthy process, more than half the weight of the rough stone is lost, ground to dust on the diamond-coated wheels. One week after the site in London, Goldberg's package arrives. In his closely knit family business, he gives the honor of opening the box to his son, Saul. Although it happens 10 times a year, these are always tense moments for father and son and chief cutter, Herbert Lieberman. You see, we saw them in London, individual papers, but now they're all thrown together. <laughs> isn't that interesting, isn't yeah, it? They, put the they threw it all, together. they mixed it all together. Remember, we saw it in different groupings. They rolled it all. They're all together now. Yeah. yeah, this is the color. When I started, and this is legend, all my friends that started cutting with me knew, if I was a pretty lousy cutter. And that was also a source of frustration. Not being able to run with the pack. So somewhere along the line, there's, there's some area where I must be able to excel. This is one area where I am able to employ and be associated with the best talent that exists. And in a vicarious manner, I'm able to excel or be number one or near number one in the field of producing the most beautiful diamonds. These are objects which go on forever, and I hope in years to come they were, they were cut in our place. They're very beautiful. And just like, just as a beautiful old piece that comes from Van Cleef or Winston or the old Cartier pieces, the older they get, the more charming, the more beautiful they are. Same is true with diamonds. When they were cut well, nobody wants to recut them years later. They don't, nothing has to be done. The maximum has been done from the very outset. So that is part of the great joy that I have even at my age, in the, I'm in my early 60s, and I still cannot wait to come in every day, and I, I, I just hope to go on forever.
New York's Diamond Dealers Club, with almost 2,000 members, is associated with similar clubs in the other major diamond centers. Here, in secure surroundings, dealers whose pockets may hold diamonds worth a fortune socialize and conduct business. The club is high-tech modern, but the atmosphere is old-world traditional. How are you going for it? How are you going for it? Jane Taller, clean stones. Uh, three, oh, oh, I don't like it. It has to be more. It has to, it has to be over the $2,000. I tell you, I make it in it too. I gave the stone for 250 Let's play. 2025 and, no, and you must make the deal. I cannot. Okay. No, What's the price? It's too what? long. It's not good. Look at this. It's a nice stone. Yeah. How much do you want? 2200 a carat. 15. No, I couldn't take 15. Mm. Will you take an offer? Yeah. I tell you something. I had the offer uh, yesterday of uh, 2900. You have an A side quality, two carat around the twenty five hundred. That's the cost two thousand one hundred dollar per carat. Uh, give you fifteen hundred. It's not bad. Therefore, the price is about twenty seven. I take a cachette. How much you want? Twelve five. Twelve five. All right. Look the stone. It's beautiful. FSI. FSI. Certificate stone. Okay, Mazal. Mazal and Brocha. Mazal and Brocha. Hebrew for luck and blessing. The words in the handshake are the deal. There are no written contracts, no lawyers, accountants, or consultants to complicate things. After the club has certified the weight of the stone, the buyer will walk away with it. The seller knows he will be paid at the specified time. When disputes arise, the club arbitrates. Those who violate the club's ethics are punished. Their names and photos will be posted in clubs around the world and no one will deal with them again. Closing in on the U.S. as a major consumer of diamond jewelry, Japan has been the target of some of De Beers' most imaginative and effective advertising. Aimed at an emerging class of working women, several TV commercials suggest the perfect investment for their customary two-month bonus. The beer's ads have already changed Japanese custom. Diamond engagement rings were all but unknown until the 1960s. Now they grace the fingers of 75% of all women about to wed. New sources of supply can challenge stability in the diamond world. Australia is now the world's largest producer. Activated in 1985, its highly automated Argyle mine yields more than 30 million carats a year. Most of Argyle's output is sold to the CSO, but a quarter goes to Antwerp for sale on the open market. Although it is not officially stated, it's clear that Argyle would like to reduce or even eliminate its dependence on De Beers. It's possible that the United States may also be a major source of diamond. In Murfreesboro, Arkansas, a diamond was found in 1906, but deposits have never been mined successfully. In 1972, the area became a state park, where visitors grub for diamonds and keep what they find. 
dirt's a little wet. A ban on power tools inspired John Burnett to create a special sifting machine using a stepladder, two lawn chairs, and much ingenuity. But you know, even if you don't find anything, you know, at least we found one, and we know they're here. If you find one, you don't want to drop it, because if you do, you'll never find it again. <laughs> it's easy to get diamond fever at the park. No one is immune, although it strikes in varying intensity. Bingo! On average, three diamonds are found each day. Most are small, under half a carat. In the summer of 1990, a consortium of large corporations began test drilling in the park to determine its suitability for commercial mining. A lawsuit by park patrons and environmental groups brought an injunction that halted the drilling. An appeal was filed, and the issue may be tied up in litigation for years. Diamond prospector Jean Boulle, director of one of the companies, is convinced that untold riches lie beneath the surface of Crater of Diamonds State Park and miles of nearby countryside. And uh, over here you have Black Lake and then Lucky Bull. And, uh, uh, over here you have Timberland, which Robert Allen discovered. What we do know um, factually and scientifically now is that we have a major reserve of diamonds uh, at Crater of Diamonds. And it's certainly comparable to most mines in South Africa. And, and probably when we really get down to it, we'll find it's a lot larger. So you're looking at at least $5 billion of reserves. The fight is classic. Developers who promise to bring jobs and prosperity to a depressed area against preservationists who say the park belongs to all the people and should be maintained for posterity. Behold a precious star. Here, said a Roman philosopher, the whole majesty of nature is encompassed in minute space to demonstrate the excellence of creation. Based in vanity, fed by greed, cherished for beauty, the appeal of gemstones goes on as it has for 20,000 years. An eternity in human terms, the briefest twinkle in terms of the forces that created the splendid stones. In the works of art we call jewelry, they please the eye and lift the spirit. Their effect is palpable, even on sophisticated film stars like Marisa Berenson. The spark has now come back into my eyes. <laughs> what can I tell you? Mm. Divine. <laughs> now I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Photographer Barry Berenson is shooting a magazine layout as her sister models a collection of jewels by Harry Winston, valued at three and a half million dollars. It's always a wonderful feeling to have beautiful jewelry on. It gives one a sense of Luxury and glamour and sensuality, I think, is something all women feel good in. And the beauty of it, when you look at a stone, there's something so deep and so intense about the way a stone looks and shines and the facets of it. And there's a sort of warmth that they give when you have them on. They make you feel great. They're a girl's best friend, what can I tell you? <laughs>
Enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library. Out of the jungles, they carved a civilization, a world of artists and astrologers. Ruled by divine kings who sustained the gods with blood, they turned to war and conquest. The Maya, why did they abandon their cities? Now we are finding new answers in the clues they left behind. Lost Kingdoms of the Maya. Since time began, Earth's creatures have been locked in an age-old battle between hunter and hunted. Nature can be cruel and unrelenting. But through countless challenges, a few persist. Find out where the wild things go and how they survive when National Geographic takes you into the world of wild survivors.